Uh, my goal uh, uh, in this session is to try and keep it relatively short in terms of my talk, <coughs> but then open it up for questions and answers, uh, which all of us here will try and feel. So that will be including staff, staff, IBA, uh, staff as well as studies. Um, and I will try and point to the right person to answer the question whenever you ask it. So let's make this pretty much an interactive session, uh, which is seeded uh, by a little talk from me as to what we think uh, some of the learnings uh, from the day session has been. I apologize if I'm biased, if I've picked out the things that actually interest me and, not, and have ignored things that don't particularly interest me. I put up this slide uh, largely because this is uh, the first slide of a presentation I gave to people at the IBA in February this year. And as you can see, uh, the topic is quite relevant today. And my interest is very much on the microeconomic side, by which I really mean behavior, and the behavior of actors in the economy, rather than the macroeconomic side, uh, which is about how the overall economy and international systems are managed. Um, my view is it's something like the flooding of the Nile, uh, if you flood an economy with water, uh, or, or the Nile with water, or an economy with money, it isn't particularly useful unless you've got the farmers down the Nile to do something with the water. In the same way, as it isn't particularly useful to flood an economy with money unless you understand precisely how the people who use the money are going to use it, and what is it So I'll talk about that a little bit. And, um, Within this, slide, this group of about 20 slides, there's one slide that I really want to point out to you, uh, which I will go to later. So um, I made a few notes. Um, and I'll try and sort of keep to the order of my notes. And the first question I asked myself was, is the financial crisis, does the financial crisis occur because of micro, i.e. behavioral reasons, or macro? Now, I have an answer to that. How many people in this room believe that it happens because of behavior reasons, behavior of individuals, institutions, regulators, governments, etc.? And how many people behave, believe that it is really because of an overly, um, or a, or a overly uh, aggressive um, monetary policy, for example? So, micro, macro, Okay, so micro wins. Um, who picked up the time for macro? After that? Uh, can you give me a reason why you think I set out that macro is a major determinant of financial crisis? What am I talking about? Is it regulators are interfering, that causes problems. Well, that's micro. <laughs> macro is monetary policy, fiscal deficit, fiscal deficit, etc. Um, and micro is behavior, how do people react? Structure is, is incentives and behavior. G. But the biggest, uh, the, on the larger scale, the policies of the whole union, like macro scale, uh, the philosophy, the monetary philosophy, that determines in the long term uh, how the liquidity in the system would flow. So uh, behavioral issues coupled with the overarching macro economics. Okay. Um, you know, the problem with all of that is that we create our own money today. The central bank almost, the, the central bank can do so much to, convert, to control interest rates. But the total supply of liquidity in the system is dependent a great deal on contractuals. And ultimately, it's the contractuals over the last crisis and the ones before where debt was a contractual are the ones that determine whether economies got overblown or did not get overblown. So I think what we will come to towards the end of this talk is very much about what is the incentive structure, not so much the macroeconomics, but what is the incentive structure that has been put in place in modern capitalist economies that gives rise to the existence of bubbles 
and ultimately gives rise to the, re to the recurrence. So, next question, G. Where would you place uh, confidence or underlying driving sentiment which, which, which drives market nowadays? Is that, is that a macro issue or would that be your the micro side? The question is, where would I place sentiment? Um, whether uh, people are optimistic about the economy or whether people are pessimistic about the economy as something that drives financial crises. I think that's very often a result, not uh, the, the driving factor. People become optimistic or pessimistic depending on how things are going. Not, I don't believe that it actually happens the other way around. And then that, of course, provides a feedback loop and it can lead to a longer gestation period, either for a growth scenario or for a depressive scenario. <coughs> <coughs> okay. So the point I'm trying to make is that ultimately it depends a great deal on what the incentive structure is. Let's go back and take a look a little bit, and I will base my 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 overview on the following slide, if I can find it. trilateral discussion that we had earlier with uh, Merkel, etc. And I want you, everybody, to take a look at this period here, which is just before, this is around September 2008. And these are the relative borrowing costs of the various countries that have outlined below. Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Belgium, Greece, Ireland. And <coughs> If you take a look at what happens then, what is really, really interesting is how long it took the markets to get from here, which is if everybody borrowing at approximately the same rate, which is what you have said, to there being a significant divergence in relative borrowing costs. Now that is a reality as of 31st of December 2011. And the question is, <coughs> Why did this happen before? And why have people begun to understand that it's really different today? And this has to do with how the be markets behave. Markets behave on the basis of rules that are set in place for the markets to work under. If those rules are, that, and by the way, those are not, by any stretch of the imagination, explicit rules. They are very often implicit rules. And the implicit rule that was being followed up until here by the markets, and I'm not trying to absorb the markets, please trust me, I'm not trying to absorb the markets, they made a mistake themselves. The implicit rule here was that within the Eurozone, there would be no bankruptcies. Right? Clearly, that Germany would bail out Greece, or France would bail out Greece if necessary. So everybody would borrow at the same rate, even though the United States had a completely different experience in that New York borrowed at a very different rate, the municipalities in New York borrowed at a completely different rate from the mun municipalities in the state of California or Arkansas. But in Europe, it was assumed that that would be the case. Although the Maastricht Treaty, regardless of that, people believe that. Today, which is here, people have a better understanding of where the markets are i.e. that countries may well go bankrupt and you may not get your money back. And not even necessarily that you won't get your money back, that you may get your money back much later than otherwise planned. Does that look similar to you in 2007, 2008 in the non-governmental markets? What does everybody think happened in 2008? Up until September 15, 2008, there was an implicit assumption within the markets that banks, rather the creditors of banks, the debt holders of banks, would be bailed out. After all, they had done more than rock. They had done it differently from the way America would have done it, but they had done more than rock. They had done Bear Stearns. No debt holder in Bear Stearns lost a cent, whether he, he or she was subordinated or senior. There was a cent. 
Northern Rock subordinated and senior debt holders, including the depositors, got government credit risk. So what is the assumption that the market makes when the government behaves that way? That we are not going to lose our money if we are credit risk. Okay? If that is the case, are they going to buy Bear Stearns bonds much, much more expensively than otherwise? Absolutely. In other words, they're not going to ask Bear Stearns to give them a significantly higher spread over the rest of the world because they think they're going to get bailed out. The question I have for you is, whose fault is it if people borrow too much? If that is a market implicit or function, and the government is kind of standing behind and saying, we're not going to let crises happen in this economy, that we're always going to bail out the economy, what are you going to do as a natural player in the market? You are going to overborrow. No question about it. You are going to over leverage. And then, after you've done that, for somebody to come along and say you weren't prudent, it's a little bit silly. So here's what happens. Along comes 2008, September 15th, and the market and the government regulators and others say, well, we're not going to do this anymore. Change of rules. What's the change of rules? They let Lehman Brothers go bankrupt. Up until 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, and I've given this talk before, Dick Ball was sitting in his office expecting a call from the Federal Reserve, and I know this for a fact, I was first time involved in this, expecting a call saying, OK, we're going to pick you up. It didn't happen. That was a rule change. If you look at the way the markets behaved, and I was a trader in the markets all the way till then, the markets had not frozen. It was a little bit more volatile. LIBOR had widened out a little bit. Interest rates were all over the place. But there was no credit crunch. Not until September 2008. You could borrow and lend in the markets. Interbank borrowing was fine. It was a little bit more volatile, but it was happening. On September 15th, the market rose absolutely froze, and there was no sanction, there was no regulation, there was no law that could have unfrozen them. Why did it freeze? If you're paying checks and somebody says, well, once upon a time the knight moved up to and left one, and now we're going to change the rule in the middle of the chess game, the knight moves up three and left two, you're going to have to think about how you make a next move, right? They change the rules in the middle of the game, so everybody shut. Shut down, shop. Absolutely shut down the And then the great powers that be in the United States realized what they had done. So they came back and they said, oh my god, no, we didn't really mean that. We didn't really mean that. Here's $760 billion worth of tar to prove that we didn't really mean that. And we are going to bail out Goldman Sachs, and we're going to bail out Morgan Stanley, we're going to bail out AIG, and we're going to make sure that all of you understand that we're never going to let the financial services sector crash again. Now, everybody's heard the term moral hazard. Does that, do you think, create the mother of all moral hazards? Absolutely it does. There is absolutely no way that the world today anticipates in a rational economic framework, rational expectations, that any country in the world is ever going to allow any bit of the banking system and the financial services sector to fail. And what does that allow the banks to do? Leverage more, borrow more, have more capital at risk. Now, then they say, OK, we're going to let people do this, borrow too much, produce too little capital, pay too little for their borrowing, and then the way we're going to control it is we're going to come in and institute quantity restrictions rather than price restrictions, i.e., we're going to regulate. Guess what? It is not going to work. It's never going to work. It is impossible. So any regulation, and this is what how we're going to get to Pakistan at some point, any regulation that has to do with that to has to do with controlling how the market works without a clear understanding about how the participants in the market operate and what models they use in their heads about what the government is going to do is not going to work. Here's the example I always give. A regulator plays chess one move at a time. He thinks he can move a piece, and he thinks that the market will react one way. And he stops, or she stops, there. That's about it, at least the European regulators and the American ones. Markets don't behave like that. 
the way we behave in the markets is, if I do this, and all of us do this, then the regulator will do this, in which case my reaction will be the following, and if I behave that way, the regulator will behave this way. We have to do that. We're trying to make money. We can't let a one-move world exist, whereas the regulators don't understand that. Example, G20. Does everybody know who the G20 is? Post the 2008 crisis, the G20 came along and said, we're going to change incentive compensation in the investment banking world and the commercial banking world. We want you all, and this is all nonsense, because the reason all of these crises happened was because the bankers got paid too much. Do you remember that? And I called myself the most reviled creature on this earth, being a banker. We all got paid too much. And they said, what we're going to do is we're going to change the structure of payment to bankers, and we're going to ask everybody to get paid with stock. The other half of 60% of your compensation, of your incentive compensation, has to come in the form of stock in the company. Well, this is 2009, by the way, when all of this happened. I've been in this business since 1985. I cannot remember the time when I did not get paid in stock. I have had stock in my portfolio forever. And in fact, as time went forward, as I became more and more senior, a larger and larger proportion of my net worth was in the stock of the company in which I was operating. Best example is Lehman Brothers. The people of Lehman Brothers, when they went bankrupt, lost virtually 90% of their net worth because it was all in the stock of Lehman Brothers. So when you ask the G20, why did you recommend this? They said we wanted to align the incentives of the management with the incentives of the shareholder. Now guess what? They're aligning the incentives of management with the, with the shareholder actually causes a crisis. It actually causes a crisis, or at least it causes a crisis not to be managed. Example, everybody bemoans and derides derivatives. They don't think our practice are good things, we should get rid of all derivatives. I think it's a bunch of nonsense, but that's what people think. What do you think stock is? Equity is the ultimate derivative. Equity is a call option on the value of the firm and the strike price of that call option. Everybody understands what a call option is, right? There's a call option on the value of the firm and the strike price of that call option is the debt of the firm. Simple model. Simple model. Take Now let's just walk through the model and see how a financial crisis gets managed in a model like this. When everything is going well, and everybody's making a lot of money, and the revenues of an investment bank or other banking institutions are good, everybody's happy, the stock is in the money. The stock has value. The investors in the pension funds and others are happy, the bondholders are happy, management is happy, everybody's happy. Well, managing things when everybody's happy is rather easy. Now let's just take a look at what happens when things start to change a little bit. It doesn't have to change a lot. Choti the chota the jarka. Revenues tail off. Revenues tail off, and the market starts to think that the equity is going to be devalued a little bit. So the equity comes down in value. Now, equity becomes worth less and less over time. And what happens? is that the value of the company looks more and more like the value of the debt of the company. So the strike price of the equity remains the same, is what I owe. But the value of the debt equity drops. What is the incentive of the guy who owns equity in the company at that point? Extreme example, company's debt is worth 80. No, call it 100, maybe. Company's debt is worth 100, nominal value. Equity was once, the value of the enterprise was once worth 120. Everybody's happy, right? Equity is worth 20, debt is 100. Change in circumstances, equity is now worth zero. Extreme example, but it's the model. Debt's worth 100. Why is the guy who owns equity going to do? Sorry? 
run out? No, no. Why would you run out? If you ran out, you still get zero. He's going to count. For if he t throws the dice, 50-50 chance, doesn't use his brain, just throws the dice on an asset worth 10. 50-50 chance that the asset will either be worth 20 or zero. What's he going to do? Chuck the dice. Now suppose he chucks the dice with assets from the balance sheet. The value, the enterprise value of the company will go either to 110 or to 90. What's he going to do? He's going to chuck the dice. And why will the debt holders let him chuck the dice? Because they think they're going to get bailed out by the government. They don't worry. So they say, okay, let management have equity. I think it is the most inane way to pay bankers and investment bankers in the world. And then we worry about why the crisis happened. Because the regulators knew this was going on. The regulators knew the senior management of these firms was heavily incentivized to chuck the dice and more incentivized to chuck the dice as the companies got worse and worse. On the day of Lehman Brothers' bankruptcy, its leverage ratio was 70% higher than three months before. Three months before. So it isn't a question of derivatives. At the end of the day, it's a question of leverage. And to what extent does this leverage result in increased risk? And what complicity does the regulator have in this leverage? Do you think, does anybody over here think that the FSA did not know this was going on? They should have known. Did they understand what was going on? No, because they don't understand the incentive structures. Because if they understood the incentive structures, they would never, by any means, have come back and said, I want all the top investment bankers to be paid in the equity of the company. What is, so now the fair question is, to avoid financial crises, avoid leverage. To avoid leverage, make sure that the banks don't over leverage, because that is where most of the leverage gets created. In order to stop getting the banks over leveraged at a time of crisis, get the incentive structure right, at the end of the day, therefore, get senior management and managers of the invest of the institutions that actually matter in a, in a country, which is banks and investment banks, get their incentives properly aligned. How do you do that? It's very easy for me to stand over here and criticize the last n years of banking practice, but you have to have a solution. And I'm sorry. To you know, to, to give out something which is not macroeconomically very sound, but microeconomically, it is absolutely simple. It's very, very simple. Here's what I would do, and I was instituting this at the Mura just before I retired. The way you pay the top bankers is in what I call the capital structure of the company. Example. I'm getting a $100 bonus. I mean, my salary is $1, dollar, and I'm getting $100. Let's assume that that's the balance. A $100 bonus. How should the company pay me the $100? If it gives me the $100 in equity, it's a mess, right? Because at a time of crisis, I'm going to pump. The right way to do this is to give me a portfolio so that as time passes and I get more and more senior in the institution, the portfolio that I have looks very much like the portfolio of the enterprise, not the equity, which is a change in the capitalist system. What I'm proposing is a change in the capitalist system so that I get, if the market value of the company is out of 100 <coughs> market value, $20 equity, $50 senior debt, and $30 subordinated debt, I should get, as a senior manager, exactly that. $20 of equity, $50 of senior debt, $30 of subordinated debt. Now think about what happens when there's a crisis, when the equity valuations drop. Am I going to punt? No. Probably not, because I'm worried about my debt. Have I created, have I regulated the financial services sector? Absolutely not. Have I gone in and said, well, buddy, you've got to have that percent of capital, and I know you can fool me about what the capital ratios are, but I want you to have 8% of capital. I don't need to do that. Um, I don't need to do that. I just get the incentive right. Now, it's very easy to do that in com companies. How do you do that in countries? How do you go about 
creating the right incentive structure in the country. If you take a look at this over here, and what has happened subsequently, it is exactly the market model that they were using for the banking system that went wrong. The market model that it had an implicit assumption. And it wasn't, as Aris said, really, that money was pouring into these countries. Money was not pouring into those countries. These countries were borrowing like hell. They were sucking it in because they could borrow at zero. They were allowed to borrow at zero. Neither the ECB nor the regulatory environment in Brussels did anything about the fact that these countries were leveraging themselves up to here at a price that was highly inappropriate. Well, they maybe didn't know. But when you create an environment in which the country behaves like this, or the company behaves like this, you can't then come back and be holier than thou and say, you guys have to pay for the mistakes of your life. It doesn't work like that. At the end of the day, if I buy subordinated debt in a company, and the company starts to do badly, the company starts to do badly, I have to expect that my subordinated debt is going to be worth less than when I bought it. And I have to be able to take that loss. By the way, I have to be able to take that loss even if I buy senior debt. If the contract is sanctified, to the extent that you allow contracts to be bust at every crisis, then the ex-ante behavior of the market participants is to assume that the contract will be bust at the next crisis, and so their behavior changes. So the crisis is not created by one event. It's created by how people behave, how people behave before and how people behave afterwards. And that is really the, the thesis that I have. And I wanted to present that thesis and put it in the context of management of financial crises, and at the end of the day, learn what has happened in America and in Europe, and see whether we can apply that to future regulatory policies. Again, if we don't learn from what we have seen, um, then I think we're absolutely doomed. Every single financial crisis that I've ever read about, Tulip, 1929, you pick them, is predicated on leverage. Whether it is, whether it is senior debt or subordinated debt, is predicated on leverage. Leverage is a very easy word, but I want to try and explain to you what I mean by leverage. And leverage means the following. Leverage means that I am short a call option. The guy who lends money is short an option. And that, if you create too much of these short positions and call options from the lender, create an enormous incentive on the side of the borrower to create volatility. So the more leverage there is, leverage is inherently not bad. The problem with leverage is simply that if it gets to be too much, then the call option goes out of the money more quickly, and it causes the guy who borrows the money to throw the guy more quickly. How do you control leverage? Not by saying you can only have this much leverage. Because when I'm running an investment bank, and the FSA comes in session, you have to have a capital base of 8%. Trust me, it doesn't matter what my position is, my capital base will be 8%, I'll figure out a way. Accounting-wise, I'll figure out. The way you fix that is by fixing the incentive structure of the people who manage the business. And that, to my mind, is a core learning. Thank you very much. I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, how about when uh, a country is borrowing and then I'll get a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to know that, uh, just for example, recent example of Pakistan. In Pakistan, there was a clear cut uh, indication in last one year that there's going to be a discount rate cut and this and that in the market, they were wise and stuff. And the people are start uh, buying the government securities aggressively. Everyone was entering into the buying, go, go, buying the government securities and overly leveraging the government. Now the thing is, the one side, the government is the one who is setting the, uh, through the monetary policy, the interest rates. On the other side, the government is also the borrower. 
So now the thing is when the borrower is the person who is setting the interest rates also in the country and he is giving the indication to look, right now I am borrowing at 12% and after a, a week or so I probably will borrow at 10 25%. Then, uh, I, I, I understand what you said, but by and large, you know, we hope that uh, in, in, a, in the modern economy, the interest rate setting mechanism is independent of government, otherwise moral hazard. I mean, the kings of England always, you know, <laughs> utilize that moral hazard. We're going to ask her what moral hazard is now he had. Um, you're right, at the end of the day, you know, fiscal policy can determine long-term interest rates and spread that and the curve. I totally understand that fiscal policy and the, and the assumption that markets make about what fiscal policy is going to do tomorrow, what is going to do tomorrow sets the interest rate curve. So the long-term rate cannot be set by the state bank, but the short-term rate, rate can be, and and that is independent of governments, and and you know that's like. Then when there will be an upward shift. I mean, just because of the fiscal and the monetary yeah. policy in the yeah, it costs you more. I just wanted to go back a little bit, I just one second, I just wanted to make a couple of points about Mustafa uh, uh, a couple of his statements. Um, one of them was about Pakistan being insulated. Um, and I, the only comment I want to make about that is if you think, think about an ocean, um, the, the fish that are kind of swimming around at the bottom of the ocean are pretty insulated from the storms above. And the question is, do I want to be swimming around the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> so so, that, so I, 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 thought, I thought that would be the analogy that I would like to give. bottom feeders look at what bottom feeders <laughs> So sometimes the bottom feeders look up and say there's a storm, but most of the time they look upstairs and they say, are they, I want to be there. I want to be there. So yeah, yeah I, I do want to say that. And uh, the only other point I'd like to make is about the currency peg to the Deutsche Mark. That you had said that Germany should go out of the mechanism. And maybe you should set up a Deutschmark and everybody should peg to the Deutschmark. Well, unfortunately, you, you might be right, but it's not very much different between what's happening in the, in the euro and a tech currency peg. I mean, Salu and I were talking earlier about um, you know, the Turkish crisis, the Thai Pod crisis, the Argentinian crisis. Virtually every one of those crises was created by pegging their currency to the dollar and then not being able to manage their fiscal and their domestic debt structure. And, and can I, can yes, please, I'd like it. Absolutely, I mean, uh, the outlook is very easy. Yeah, uh, I, just, microphone. I just thought, you know, I, I like doing that, just taking a view and just trying to find it. Uh, basically, again, people have talked about uh, a smaller euro or something else, the mark, let's say. But the problem there is, like, you know, given the experience people have had now in the past two or three years, people are not going to be alive. The peg gives them a little bit of flexibility. Over and above the euro. That is. Yeah. But and that's all it is. Are they happy for that? Yeah, I, I really like this, uh, this model that you proposed for executive compensation, where rather than equity based compensation, yeah. we have a capital structure based compensation. Yeah. But if I tie this to what you mentioned earlier, if obviously as a capital structure based compensation part of your compensation, you are essentially part of your investment is debt-based. Now there again, it depends on your view of what the government will do. I want if, that, if that you still believe that the government no. will be, I would just like the other data, other than that. Those are independent, I totally agree with you, but I'm trying to solve one problem at a time. And the reason, the reason I suggested that that capital structure-based compensation should only be for the banking sector um, is because you cannot regulate the non-banking sector, and you don't need to regulate the non-banking sector because there is no implicit foot for General Motors, although in America there's an implicit foot for everybody, but there is no implicit foot for, for, for an automotive company or, 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 a, or a widget manufacturer. But because the financial services sector and the, regu and the, and the banking sector is so interconnected with the central bank, there is an implicit foot. And if you are going to give an implicit foot, then you need to regulate and what I was trying to suggest was that your regulation should be wise regulation, which is not to regulate capital base and leverage, which you cannot transparently see, because I can always fool you on that, but to regulate something which creates incentives which make you behave properly. Now, you have to assume on top of that that the individual actors will build rational expectations models on how the government will change its behavior in the future. That I'm not, you know, sure. Yes? I have a question about uh, Lehman Brothers' bankruptcy. What do you think is the reason that... It did happen. 
Oh boy, that's a multi-pronged question. There are two questions there. One, the first question is why did it let Lehman Brothers go bankrupt? And the second question is, if it's going to let it go bankrupt, why did it do it in the way the US did it rather than the way the UK would do it? Um, I, I, I think uh, the answer to the first question is because it was under the misapprehension that given a fixed amount of equity or capital that they had, they needed to save Merrill Lynch uh, and not Lehman Brothers. Uh, and they thought Lehman Brothers was in some sense smaller than Merrill Lynch because Merrill Lynch had its tentacles all through the United States. But the problem was that they failed to recognize, despite the fact that the Treasury of the United States was populated by Goldman Sachs bankers, what they failed to recognize was that Lehman Brothers had a business called Prime Brokerage, which is a lending business, which is way, way bigger than anything Ireland ever had. And that's what caused the big problems. That's why the markets froze, not because of some retail franchise. Yeah. So they made a mistake. They saved one or the other. In my opinion, they could have used $20 billion to save Lehman Brothers. If they had used $20 billion to save Lehman Brothers, I don't think TARP would have been necessary. I also believe that moral hazard would have been there as it is. And in fact, moral hazard has been much more dramatically um, uh, sort of sanctified by TARP. So those are my answers. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sir. Yeah. Uh, a uh, compensation structure based on a uh, capital uh, position of any particular company, you need to have uh, very strong underlying liquid markets where you have a price on subordinated debt and uh, NCA debt. Say in the Pakistani concept, if, if I'm all holding on to a security which I can't sell in the market, would that be effective? Um, you know, it's a good question. Um, where, where you don't have a, a traded market, what you essentially have is you don't have a multiple on the future earnings of equity. And then the only thing you have is book value. And to the extent that you can set it up on the basis of book value, yes, it's just as effective as otherwise. Absolutely. The only difference is that the, you know, the, the fluctuations in equity price, which is really the discount rate for future earnings streams, uh, that doesn't happen. So you just go on the basis of book. And then it's just, it's just as effective. Totally as effective. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the context of this financial crisis management, do you think that the right has the role to restore the confidence of the market? That's it? Or does it have a larger responsibility of uh, like uh, for the economic development and, and uh, for this? So what is the role of the regulator? No, I, think, I don't think the role of the regulator, uh, the question was what is the role of the regulator? I don't think the role of the regulator has anything to do with development. Uh, I mean, I think it depends on the regulator. A uh, 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 even, even state banks or central banks have narrowed the focus of their role. Um, and, and they are trying to engineer efficient markets and liquid markets and allow capital to flow where the risk-reward characteristics are market determined and proper. And then that leads to development and that leads to growth. But that, the, the ultimate goal is to make efficiency, to make things Just run through the market effectively. The market themselves. And transparency. And, all of the, and then, of course, you know, the central bank, unlike the FSA, does have a role to control prices and, 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 and to control banking system prices and, and things of like that nature. The, the regulator doesn't have any of those roles, and I don't think the regulator should pay attention to all that. Yeah, I think in, in emerging markets, I think the regulator has a development role, not in national economic development, but in the development of the financial system. Absolutely. We've got a primary market, just banks. We have no secondary markets, no bond markets, no trading markets. We don't have simple things like commercial papers. Laws exist, but the activity doesn't, because we've got five big banks that uh, basically have a lot of the liquidity and they're not particularly interested yeah. in being disintermediated by this activity. Now there, the regulator, I think, has a duty to make these markets more liquid. Otherwise, uh, uh, you know, our stock of debt, local currency debt is more than our total deposits. Now that is the case nowhere in the world. And the reason is that we have nothing on balance sheet in terms of uh, credit and assets. I think to bring the, the, one of the most important things, that, and, and when Salu was, was there, that he tried to do was to, make, to bring the markets in Pakistan to the modern era. And one of the reasons you have this problem here, where the government borrows at a rate higher than banks, which is, I, I think it is, it is unique, um, is because um, there is no way to disintermediate the banks. So what the, what the government does is it goes out and sucks the money out of the banks by giving them treasury bills at an egregious rate. 
The banks then have effective monopoly power on deposit money, but I can't deposit it anywhere, and they screw the public. So if the government was able to go this intermediate, i.e. have brokers, where you and I could borrow government bills and trade them and, and put them into a custody account, uh, and, 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 and we, just, just, we just throw the banks out. And then the banks would have to pay for a few rates, and then I would only give banks money if I'm an individual at a rate higher than I give to the government. So it's all about markets, and about it's all about structure of markets, uh, not about legislation. And it makes sense for the government to do what it's doing, but and not for themselves, but not for the market. Gee. I have um, a question related to the basic use of the new is very different to all And that is exactly what you see for the society. And now that it's become uh, through those slides, that slide demonstrates to me that why is the market believe there is one euro? Yeah. Single is indivisible. <coughs> that Germany would borrow at the same rates, so Greece would borrow at the same rates as Germany. The moment it became clear that uh, when it comes to risk, a country can be on its own, even though it's part of the Eurozone, even you see that you can be on its own. So this, yes, common currency area is a good thing, but uh, without uh, even a, a, a few sort of fiscal problems. And then, as others will say, in America you've got fiscal and monetary union, and then everyone knows that, so states borrow at different rates. If California is about to go past, New York State at one stage couldn't borrow. They actually couldn't borrow in the same because the cars being the Fed wouldn't be able to pay back. Okay. So, so those are fine things, but when you've got market disability, the market is transparent, the market is fair, the market is reasonably priced. Otherwise, to go into a currency area without a fiscal union is, you know, I think you're going back to the gold standard, and if we ditch the gold standard, then you know, I'm afraid the euro is beginning to look like that. Just to add to Salim's point about New York, um, the crisis in New York demonstrates how the United States was able to organize itself whereas Europe can't. Very simply put, what the US did when New York went pear-shaped was the US issued government, federal government bonds and used that money to buy New York bonds. And effectively, there was a fiscal compact where the government forced the public taxpayer to lend to the government at a German, German rate and then lent to New York. Very good question. Very good question. Is that your only question? Uh, how many hours do you have? No, the, the, the answer is no, moral hazard was not the only determining factor, not by a long shot. I think moral hazard was the ultimate, dis the ultimate result of the behavior of regulators and governments uh, to bail out banks that had created excessive leverage based on the incentive structures that I was talking about earlier, which had nothing to do with moral hazard, really. Uh, well, a little bit to do with moral hazard, not that much, but with an anticipation of foreign hazard. But by actually implementing some of those policies, bailing out subordinated debt holders and senior debt holders in the way that they did, that created further moral hazard. And my view, again, I might be wrong, um, uh, the moral hazard is now so in, so built in that the cost of bailout will be uh, horrendous. And it's going to happen. There's no question about it. It's going to happen. It's just a question of when. And the problem is that every single financial crisis with the crisis that we have seen has been uh, created with more leverage than the one before. G, after. Uh, my basic question is that commercial banks have virtually become a holding, com holding companies in Pakistan. Previously, they had uh, investment in portfolio. Now they have uh, subsidiaries like AMC. Now they have subsidiaries like insurance companies. Now they have brokerage house and subsidiaries. Do you think that this kind of uh, supermarket concept is dangerous for Pakistan? or this provides some kind of a strength to the financial system? Yes. I think it's not just 
should be a universal bank. I think you know the issue is in the basic plot abroad. We see, but Pakistan we are at the enough stage. Nothing wrong with the powerful financial institutions sponsoring a diverse view of other financial activity. But our problem is something else. We have no limits on how much industrial families can own banks. So you're not only getting a linkage between different types of financial activity, you're getting a linkage of big business with big banks and then with the financial sector. You're aggravating, uh, accentuating corporate power and you're creating huge business oligopolies. Uh, not banking uh, companies, the business oligopolies <coughs> that have got you that have huge countervailing power. And it has become more and more in India. Initially, no business family would own more than 3%. I believe they've now taken that decision. So one of the things we were looking at state at, at the state was how to deal with this issue of this, you know, a huge consolidation of business power and financial power. So as far as banks doing different things are concerned, I support it because who else can? Who else can set up a large, who can compete with the two, as it so happens, the two biggest insurance companies we have are both owned by banks, UGP <coughs> by, directly by Habib and RGB directly by, by MCB. All right, now there's going to be, who can compete with them? This is, you know, Allied can set up an insurance company. So, you know, no, no, no issue with that. Uh, you want to uh, go into serious investment banking? Our investment banks don't have the capital. These big banks do. Let them do it. So far, so good. But one thing, of the step beyond that, where we align a lot of financial and industrial power to consolidate, because that has to be dealt with in time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, after experiences, experiencing many financial crises at global level, are we capable enough to preempt the uh, global crisis before it happens? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm asking about the proactive approach mm -hmm. about financial crisis. Uh, yeah, is there a proactive approach? Um, you know, I, that's a very tough question for me to answer. Can you uh, can you actually see the crisis coming? And guess what? Some people can. Uh, I mean, 2008 is a very, seven rather is a very good example. Goldman Sachs uh, was out there selling subprime mortgage uh, mortgages on the balance sheet in 2007. And I'll pat myself on the back again. I sold five and a half billion dollars worth of subprime mortgages on Nomura's balance sheet in 2007. So some people can, can sort of get scared of the crisis happening. But at the same time, I never bought into the you know, technology boom of 2000. So I got that right, wrong. So I get some things right, I got some things wrong. Can the market as a whole see a crisis coming? I think it's very difficult. Um, and it's often just a very small event that turns uh, a positive growth path into a self-fulfilling uh, crash. And we've got a self-fulfilling crash. But I don't think that you can anticipate it. I don't think you can fix it. Um, all, I do, all I believe is that what you can do is when it does happen, allocate the cost of the fix better than we allocate it today. We allocate it extraordinarily badly. The next As I said, it's probably China is not going to stop. It's going to stop lending to the United States. But you didn't hear it. No, I don't answer it. It's like uh, the second marriage, the plan for four pool disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and neither so you know, I have experience with that. <laughs> you can, you can, crisis will happen. They will happen. And I think it's one of the prices you pay for having an open economy, a capitalist economy. Um, and I think if you try to control it, there was a, a, in February, I think somebody asked me the question, well, if you guys are all so smart and you know all of this stuff, why do you allow financial crisis to happen? Well, you know, we can't stop it. And it's just a, a, the ability to be able to manage our way through it. That's, that's the thing we can do. And then ensure that the costs of bailout are properly allocated. Nowadays, the costs of bailout are allocated to all the taxpayers. Um, and particularly the guys who were savers, are the ones who lose out the most. And the guys who are borrowers benefit the most. So that there is an enormous incentive built into the system to be a borrower. And if you're a Muslim, you know, you don't want to be in the debt market. So maybe maybe Muhammad knew something that we don't know. I mean, you know, that you shouldn't have debt. That's an extreme answer, but Christianity said never a borrower, let there be. So debt 
debt is an issue, that, and debt is an ultimate contractual, right? You, you long one, short something else. And um, how do you control that? How do you regulate that? Uh, that is the way you stop severity of financial crisis when they happen. You can't stop them happening. But exposed analysis is always 2020. We know today that they did make profit. The economy recovered, they got it right. But at the time when they did it, they took a lot of risk. Yeah, of course. On, on, absolutely. And on behalf of the taxpayers. So the right way to say it is that, that ultimately what happens is that the risk gets transferred and either the taxpayer makes money or loses money. But on your issue, let me just point out something very interesting. And I totally agree with that thinking. When people um, made so many noises about the subprime crisis in the United States and said, uh, oh my God, all these, uh, uh, you know, all these companies have lost so much money on making subprime loans, people forget who benefited from these. Other than the 3 or 4% growth in the economy, most of it is zero sum. So if somebody is losing a ton of money in the subprime, somebody is making money. And the, and the analysis, or the, not the analysis, but the story I gave last time was about the Mexican immigrant who took California, who has no net worth, who's a ninja, no income, no job, um, and he gets to buy a $100 house, lends money at $100, lives in it for five years, goes out and borrows another $20 on a home equity loan, buys a Ferrari, drives it around, crisis happens, gives a house back to the bank, Ferrari back to the car lender, and he's had a great five years. The consumer surplus of that five years is not calculated anywhere. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, you all, when you have, whenever you have these problems, like in Germany, you have a similar problem, the German population doesn't see the benefit that is received from the euro for so many years. It does see it, but it doesn't think that it needs to pay for it in some way. Uh, so in the same way, the Americans don't recognize where they try to bring in, uh, you know, uh, import duty on Chinese goods, the benefit that the consumer gets from being able to buy plasma television to seven hundred dollars when two years ago he was buying them at seven thousand dollars. So your consumer surplus to it is called And in the same way, taxpayer got cost be say that I calculate that what which Ex post, you're right. Ex ante there was an enormous risk of the balance sheet. It's across the board, and it hits the real sector. 
עכשיו רק את תנועה צומת, אם אנחנו נותנים את האקונומי של המרקט לדיסאינטרמדיאט דאט טריידינג, המספר של הבנק שצריך להיות בבנק, כמו הבנק של 35, 38, כמה בנק יש? 38 בנק, אתה יכול לדמיין את הבנק? לא בנק של הבנק. Foreign banks in your hands. Some in Malaga, 38 banks are operating over here. It is the world's most overbanked country. And it's largely because virtually all debt flows occur through the banking system rather than being disintermediated. I mean, the United Kingdom does very well on four banks. So Australia, Canada, Jahabi are thinking, Hamari has 38 banks. So it's a bit of a mess. Oh, no, ladies always get preference. The question is, didn't the development in most of the eastern countries, Japan, Korea, China, come through uh, a banking? A ba yes, absolutely, you know, in the earlier part of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, tradable notes have existed forever, and the banking system um, discounted before the banking system. So the ability to borrow and lend, I mean, during, during uh, Rasulullah's last time, there were no banks, yet trade finance, was, was the, the way that the, the world worked. So I think if you look at uh, the way Korea developed, trade finance probably, um, and I'm not an expert on this stuff, but trade finance, finance probably was a pretty big chunk of the net debt indebtedness of, of the country. So the banking system is necessary, but as a country develops, you need to disintermediate. And we haven't done that. We're way behind the curve. Yeah. We need to, oh yeah, desperately. We need to open up the, the markets. We need to stop being bottom feeders. Um, uh, and, and we need to be a little bit more developed and take a little bit more risk in order to grow properly. And we, ha we haven't done that. Is that, you know? Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you.